Yes. We got episode 52, Environmental Toxins Impact on Your Life with Laura Adler. Let's do this. Welcome to Solving Healthcare. I'm Cordial Karamantang. I'm an ICU and palliative care physician here in Ottawa and the founder of Resource Optimization Network. We are on a mission to transform healthcare in Canada. I'm going to talk with physicians, nurses, administrators, patients, and their families because inefficiencies, overwork, and overcrowding affects us all. I believe it's time for a better healthcare system that's more cost-effective, dignified, and just for everyone involved. We are back in full effect, episode 52. So excited. Before I forget, a couple things. One, you might hear a little bit of background noise. It's Daddy Dake here. This is the only way this is going to happen. I apologize. Second, I want to give a quick shout out to my boy, Tom Saris, who has been throwing down some intermittent fasting. He's a, fel- he's a colleague of mine, fellow intensive care doc, and he has shed about 30 pounds over this COVID period, which I am... I just want to give him mad love because him and I, we talk about some of these risk factors for getting COVID and, and becoming ill with it. And he took the power back, started fasting, shedding the pounds. Now he looks like a Greek god. So shout out to you, my boy. A couple other housekeeping items. I want to give some love to Kim Sutton from the Positive Productivity Podcast and the designer of our new website, SolvingHealthcare.ca. It is beautiful. It is precious. And actually, if any of you guys want to check it out, jump on it right now. There'll be links in the show notes. But yeah, check out her work. You can use promo code Solving Healthcare if you want to develop your own website. Learn about how to make more with time. Actually, her podcast is awesome too. So shout out to Kim Sutton. Thank you so much for your help. All right, let me tell you about our show today. We have the one and only Lara Adler. She's an expert in environmental toxins. She's an educator. She's a teacher. She's a coach. And what I love about what she does is she she does it at a meta level. She teaches allied health professionals to be able to, to talk about these issues. And the w- reason why it's so important is just another tool in your arsenal. When you have somebody with chronic disease that's not getting better, they're having thyroid issues, they're having fertility issues. And the things that you're going to hear about on this episode will help you realize what some of these environmental toxins can impact what we drink, you know, the air we breathe, fragrances we use, uh, so much to learn here. But if you do want to learn more from her, she's kind enough to give give a discount for Solving Healthcare listeners using promo code Solving Healthcare. Get 20% off her courses and any of her coaching. She's amazing. And we have a guest appearance on this with Julia Hajar, who's actually did a master's in endocrine disrupting chemicals in pregnancy. Um, she's spectacular. She's also our social media lead. So uh, I can't wait for you guys to hear this. The other thing I want to quickly mention is you're going to hear a lot of, we call it Debbie Downerism when you hear this episode. A lot of things that are like, holy cow, man, these environmental toxins are everywhere. But what I love about Lara is she throws down and says, you know what? Focus on what you can control. Focus on solutions that are cheap and easy and the stuff that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. So there's there's solutions here. And the last thing I wanted to mention, too, is we talk about environmental racism, which was a concept foreign to me. But the fact that certain communities aren't able to get clean water, for example, the Flint, Michigan stuff, and how that can impact like IQ, how it can impact their ability to stay healthy essentially um it was really it was really eye-opening so with without further ado i want to introduce laura adler and co- guest co-host julia Hajar. quadcast nation we got a doozy co-host our first co-hosted episode i am so excited first of all i want to introduce laura adler like superstar enthusiast when it comes to environmental toxins and we're going to learn so much on this episode and of course julia hajar who's our social media queen and uh comes up with amazing content and actually found laura for us so um welcome you guys to the show thank you so much i'm i'm excited to to nerd out with you oh man i'm jazzed up so julia why why don't you uh start us off 
Okay, so I'm so excited to talk to you, Laura. Um, I've been following you for so long on Instagram and I learned so much from you and it's kind of nice to find somebody that talks about this kind of stuff because this is what I'm really interested in. Actually, before I even say anything, let her know your background. I don't know if we, yeah. we talked about this. Yeah, so I did my master's actually in endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, specifically in low dose BPA exposure during pregnancy and lactation. Awesome. So I'm actually so fascinated with BPA and just different types of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I've been really passionate about that for a while and it's totally changed my lifestyle. I've changed what I eat, um, what I use, the kind of things that I'm exposed to every day. I've just become more aware of. So it, I think it's exciting to have this talk just because I know a lot of people really don't know much about this area at all. To be honest, I hadn't ever heard of it until I started studying it. So I think this will be super interesting for a lot of people to listen to. Amen. It's definitely a topic that you can't unlearn. Yeah. And it's not meant to be like a scary thing, but it's just something to just be more aware of. I think I'm scared <laughs> shitless, by the way, I'm scared <laughs> shitless. <laughs> I'll just start by saying my own running joke about myself is that I can ruin anything, like anything fun that anyone's doing. I'm like, well, did you know? And I don't actually do that for fun, but I can. So like I can totally wrap the vibe of a good party. I, you know. Debbie Downer. Debbie Downer. <laughs> yeah, I love it. But I also think that, you know, this, just like Julia just said, it's not about scaring anybody. It is about empowering people with information. And when we know better, we do better. And so, you know, yes, there's a little bit of like, holy crap, I had no idea. That's terrifying. But everything that I share, I really try to present in an actionable thing that we can do in light of the information that we're sharing when there is an actionable thing that we can do to reduce our exposure or um, boost our resilience in the face of that exposure. Yeah. Love it. So Julia, where should we start? I'm, okay, I'm excited. So, yeah. So my very first question just for everyone out there is what are environmental toxins and where do you find them? Yeah. So that's actually a great question because, you know, I think when you, if you stop the average person on the street and you ask that question, what's an environmental toxin, they're probably going to think of like oil spills in the Gulf, in Alaska. They're going to think of air pollution. They think of when they hear the term environment, they're thinking of external environment, like not me out there. And so um, all of those things, air pollution, oil spills, um, soil contamination, those are environmental toxins. They're toxins in the environment. But in the conversation around environmental health, we're off, in addition to looking at those things, we're also looking at what's in our personal environment. So the products that we buy and use every day, our detergents, our beauty products, our, you know, home fragrances, scented candles, um, to the food and the water that we drink, you know, the beds that we sleep on, it's everything, the air inside our homes. So when we're talking about the environment, I tend to focus primarily on like what is in the home environment. If I think of um, what's the Charlie Brown character pig pen with the, you know, the cloud that kind of follows him around. Oh. Was that pig pen? No. Was it? Yeah, that was, that was pig pen because okay. he was only 30. So he had this like sphere <laughs> of, you know, a little fly in there and like, not that it's necessarily dirty, but like we are surrounded by this, you know, orb of exposures. So that's the environment part of what it is, what is an environmental toxin. That's what we mean. Toxin is sort of a broader term. So technically, if we're talking about synthetic chemicals like BPA, it's a toxicant. Toxin is something technically that's produced by plants or animals. Some people get really persnickety about the differences between those two. Generally, colloquially, we use the word toxin to define both man-made and natural substances. And these are substances that can have a negative effect on human health, animal health, or environmental health. So that's what we're talking about, really broadly speaking, of what is an environmental toxin. It's a chemical or substance that we encounter that can mess us up, that can cause either acute health issues or chronic health issues, meaning kind of slow burn, long time to develop, uh, you know, sometimes not symptomatic health exposure or health issues that people are dealing with. Wow. So, I mean, obviously this is a massive topic in terms of like, as you mentioned, your environment, that's everything, everywhere. So, I mean, once again, as a guy that's super ignorant with this, Maybe in terms of like the most common areas. So say, for example, if we start talking about stuff we eat or um, like what would be typical toxins that we should be nervous about and 
maybe also like what are the downstream consequences? Right. So I'll just use, I'll start with water, right? Because we drink water every day. It's a good example. So, you know, here in the United States, in other highly developed nations, we often think like, our water is great because we don't have things like typhoid and dysentery and cholera. We don't have communicable diseases. So we think because we do, we've solved that problem, like we're good and our water's clean. The reality is there are hundreds and hundreds of um, industrial chemical residues, pesticide residues, um, pharmaceutical residues that are in our drinking water that come out of our tap every single day in this country. And so while we are not dealing with communicable diseases, thanks to things like water chlorination, which has its upsides, we're also dealing with the downsides of a lot of that um, we're dealing with downsides of chlorination. We're also dealing again with all these industrial chemicals. So um, most people don't know that. They think, oh, the water out of my sink tastes good. It's fine. Um, most of the chemicals that we have in our drinking water don't have a taste. They don't have a color. So you won't know that they're there. And we're talking about, you know, chemicals that are intentionally added. So like chlorine, which obviously serves a purpose, it's a disinfectant, but we have chlorine residues in our water. So sometimes you can see the color difference in the filtered versus unfiltered water. If you have two glasses and you fill them up, one is yellowish, the other is clear because the filtered one is clear. And so sometimes you can see some contaminants, but one, chlorine as a disinfectant, if we are consuming it, what are we concerned with in the health space? Our gut microbiome. And what does our gut microbiome consist of? Living organisms. What is chlorine added to drinking water for as a disinfectant to kill living organisms? So there's not been a lot of research in this space, strangely, but there is some discussion of the consumption of chlorinated water being part of what's disrupting the gut microbiome. We do know that chlorine disrupts the skin microbiome when we shower. That's when we have like really dry skin, right? So it serves to reason that it would also cause a, a similar issue when we take it internally. But that's just one chemical. So then we have um, additives like fluoride. We consider that to be what is one of the greatest uh, achievements in, you know, in health is, is adding fluoride to the drinking water under the premise that it's going to decrease cavities in the population. That's not accurate. Um, there's many countries that don't have the same type of cavity issues in children that don't fluoridate their water. Fluoride as a chemical, as a compound, causes thyroid issues. So for people who want to think back to their like organic chemistry, periodic table of elements kind of realm, fluoride, chlorine, which I just mentioned, bromine are all halogens. So on the periodic table, they're all in the same column. They're all halogenated compounds. We're going back, guys. We're going back. Yeah, we're going way back. <laughs> The other chemical that's there, or compound element that's there, I should say, is iodine. So what do we need iodine for? We need iodine for normal thyroid function, for normal growth and development, for healthy fetal development. And all halogenated chemicals will compete with iodine for a place in the thyroid. So when we're exposed to chlorinated compounds, fluorinated compounds, or brominated compounds, those compounds are going to compete with iodine for docking in your thyroid, and that's going to cause downstream thyroid problems. Now, you asked about, like, what are the downstream effects of some of these exposures? I'll just pick that one chemical and that one issue is if you have low maternal thyroid, so if someone's pregnant and they have low thyroid, thyroid is necessary for the healthy, normal neurological development of your baby. And so this is partly why some studies looking at fluoride ingestion are showing loss of IQ in children, lowered IQ levels, meaning it's robbing their intellectual capacity because it's interfering with normal neurological and brain development. Um, too much thyroid, uh, low, too much fluoride leading to suppressed thyroid function also is highly correlated with increases in autism. Why? neurological brain development. So there's a lot, that's just one downstream effect for people that are dealing with chronic autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's, which is a, a autoimmune that affects the thyroid. Those people should not be drinking fluorinated water. Ideally, they should not be drinking chlorinated water for the same reason. So filtering our water is really important. You know, we have, I mentioned pharmaceuticals, 
we have residues, not only of pharmaceuticals like birth control in our drinking water, we have antidepressants in our water, and we also have narcotics. And there's a couple universities that have done some really interesting work where they've been able to look at the amount of narcotic residue in the wastewater and extrapolate out how many active drug users there are in the community. Isn't that wild? Uh, you, 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 you're just blowing my mind a little bit. So you're throwing down that when you analyze water, you are seeing evidence of antidepressants and narcotic within yeah. I mean extremely water. low levels extremely right. low right. levels but you know also things like antibiotics in the drinking water right because we have a lot we have problem with over antibiotic use in the human population and like a lot of substances drugs compounds that we take like they're not like they're metabolized by the body and we pee them out if they're water soluble right so they go they get peed down the drain and our water infrastructure meaning the water treatment plants you know, they're designed to filter out bacteria, some chemicals, but they're not, they were never designed to filter out um, pharmaceuticals and narcotics and synthetic estrogens from birth control. They just, they don't have, most of them don't have the capacity to do that. And some of that is a budgetary issue, but a lot of it is a regulation issue. So, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency under the Safe Water Drinking Act only regulates like 89, I think it's 89 or 91 contaminants, but there's hundreds that are in our water. So they don't even have to test for or look at or do anything about all these other chemicals because it's not required of them to do that. And often they can't afford it. So this is also, and water is such an important topic because this is also where we get into social and economic disparities because we have people that if you live in a, in a, lower income community where there's not enough taxpayer money coming in to fund the fancy, expensive water treatment plant, then that community is going to have higher contamination in their drinking water. Lead, uh, uh, lead in the drinking water in Flint, Michigan is a really good example of that. It's like everyone's water is different because of what's being put in and because of how fancy is your water treatment plant? How advanced is it technology-wise? So this conversation is vast. Yeah. I mean, somebody just sent me an Instagram DM saying, hey, I'm remodeling my house. I want to make sure that we're starting fresh and have all, I'm like, that's like a 10 hour conversation, girl. <laughs> not a Instagram you can't DM. afford that. Um, I was like, yeah, it's it a like, whole you know, other thing. Man, but I just, I, I literally did an interview today about, uh, you know, disparities and, you know, when it comes to race and, and uh, low socioeconomic, uh, status and just man that just really hit home there that a lot well, of well I'll take that even I'll take that even deeper because yeah. environmental racism is incredibly rampant um it is massive systemic problem in this country and all this is sort of one one small tiny example so if we have lower income communities that are living in um housing complexes that are old that aren't kept up well what is likely to be present there? Lead paint. Are those buildings going to be maintained? Typically, they're not maintained. And calls to maintain them are left unheard. Lead paint, like fluoride, is a neurotoxin, causes, in addition to neurological and intellectual disabilities, it robs IQ points. And so when you have a population of people, a predominantly Black, Latinx, people of color living in these communities, not only are they being disproportionately exposed to lead from chipping paint in older housing stock that the city doesn't seem to care about, but that lead exposure is leading to a, a drop in IQ points. Now, a couple point drop in IQ on an individual level, like not really noticeable, but population wide, that's actually massive. And what that means is that there is downward social mobility. It's harder for them because they can't get good grades in school, they have a hard time paying attention. Um, they have reduced intellectual capacity because of that low IQ. They have a harder time elevating themselves out of that dynamic. The other component, just to blow your mind a little bit more, when I learned about this, I was like, huh, um, is that there's a very, very strong um, body of research that shows that uh, lead exposure in childhood leads to, particularly in males, an increase in aggressive and violent behavior as they move into young adulthood. 
So this literally feeds into the school to prison pipeline. So where do people who live in these communities who are have been robbed of IQ points because of their terrible housing, who are now starting to express not only violent and aggressive behavior because of lead exposure, but probably because of their frustration of being stuck in this space and all of the other racism that they have to deal with. How does that contribute to this, um, this whole culture of moving Black people into the prison system? Um, I think it's an important piece of that conversation that's not being had. There's always a desire to blame and say it's somebody's fault. They didn't do this. They did do that. It's a part of it is being a product of or the, having the unfortunate circumstances of growing up in a situation that's not within their control. So it's a topic that I just think that anybody who's dealing in the health space, anybody who's working with communities of color, no matter where, particularly in the low income communities like this, these types of interventions are non-negotiable if we want people to be healthy and well. It's not negotiable. Yeah, I mean, it gets back to, you know, what are some of the biggest bang for your buck interventions when it comes to to health of all um, backgrounds? And, you know, when you when you think of if you don't have safe housing, or like safe in the sense, like not violent, but safe in environmental toxins, as you're, you're talking about, if you don't have clean drinking water, you know, like it's hard. It's just another layer of obstruction. Yeah. So much harder. Yeah. Yeah. It's so much harder to move beyond that. It's wow. not a level playing field. And so this is really where like equity, the conversation around equity comes in. It's like those people need more attention right now in terms of cleaning up the housing stock and making sure they have clean water, access to healthy foods, they're not living in food deserts. So, you know, I, this is where I think the conversation of like equality versus equity is really important yeah. because they need they need more than other communities yeah. in order to level the playing field for everyone. Absolutely. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wasn't thinking we were going there, but it, it's, I mean, like, it's so timely. There. No, no. I, yeah. I mean, it's so timely. I, I mean, we'll, we'll get to some of the solutions overall in a bit, but just to, just to close the loop too, with the going back to the water, just to make sure that um, our listeners got a great picture in terms of summarizing bad drinking water. Like we mentioned how it could, it's been tied to some de, um, the autism, as you mentioned, is there any other big ticket health items that that uh, we didn't cover in terms of, you know, poor that are associated with poor drinking water? I mean, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, uh, fertility issues, like it literally runs the gamut. And so this is where the conversation around toxins can be really confusing because environmental chemicals are linked to every single chronic health issue that people have. Not and so like a single chemical and you know Julia maybe you are recognize this from your your work with something like bisphenol A or the bisphenols like just because it's an endocrine disrupting chemical um, like it has more than one um, sort of endpoint for health effects and the same chemical exposure in five different people might result in five different sets of symptoms. It's really complicated. It kind of depends on our genetics, where are our own weak links genetically, health-wise, and where are these chemicals causing problems and people can depend on what's happening with them and what else in the vortex of exposures, like where does that fit into the bigger picture of are they eating well? Is there, you know, is are they drinking too much alcohol and compromising liver function? Like our livers are primary workhorse for detoxification. And that's, you know, to the conversation of like, what is some of the action steps that we can do? And we can talk about this later in depth more if we want is, you know, we have to make sure that our liver's working. We have to make sure that we're pooping. We have to make sure that like these sort of basic functions of our anatomy are working optimally so that it can do its best to deal with the exposures that we have no way of controlling. So in my business, I like to, you know, say we change the things that we can control so we worry less about the ones that we can't because I drive a car, there's toxins in my car, I walk on the sidewalk, I'm getting car exhaust, like I'm not going to be that person that's like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, my joke here is like people say, oh, after they learn about this, that they want to go live in a plastic bubble. And then my joke is always like, well, but what kind of plastic and is it off-gassing or leaching? <laughs> 
It's a joke. It's like only really nerdy people who understand this conversation get. But I don't think we should live that way. You know, there was a great article. This maybe was six or seven years ago. I think it was in like Slate or one of those magazines that was titled, Want to Avoid Toxic Chemicals? Drop Out of Modern Society. And the article was highlighting a community of people that had extraordinary low levels, much lower than the regular population um, here in the U.S. And it was an old order Mennonite population, basically like an Amish type religious community that doesn't use personal care products. They don't buy food in plastic. They grow their own food. And I argue that like, we shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to just be normal human being and do our normal stuff um, Mm -hmm. without having to, to be wary of all these chemical exposures. And it it can be a little bit hard sometimes. Yeah. I mean, you gotta live, you gotta Um, live life. Sorry, Julie, you were gonna, you were gonna say something. No, no, it's okay. I was just saying the problem with society now is it's different than it was 50 and 60 years ago in terms of all the amount of chemicals you're exposed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of these chemicals maybe weren't even present when, you know, in the 50s or 40s. So that on top of cell phone usage and extra pollution and all that stuff, it's all kind of compounding yeah. into huge effect. And I think this is probably why we're seeing rates of chronic disease, you know, different types of cancers, lymphomas, where we're seeing, you know, diabetes, heart disease, all, fertility issues in both men and women. Like these are all on the, on the uprise. Um, some types of birth defects, things like autism, of course, is likely because exactly what you just laid out. Our physiology was like, it's a miracle that we're all walking around and doing our thing, considering all the shit that we throw at it. And we have this innate ability to detoxify that we evolved to have that all you know creatures have but if we think about why we have this system it's because we needed to make sure we weren't eating poisonous plants or poisonous snakes or whatever it wasn't designed to deal with synthetic chemicals that the field of science and chemistry dubs forever chemicals because they don't break down these are these non-stick PFAS chemicals that Right now, we're in 99% of the population. They're everywhere in wildlife. They're in polar bears in the Arctic. And they're 100% man-made chemicals that never go away. So these are novel. We're talking about things like coronavirus being novel. We're like, oh, what, what's going on? We don't know anything about it. That's what's happening with chemistry. There's just this blind, like, oh, cool, I'm going to make this thing. And it's going to do this fancy thing for these types of products. And it's this new industry that's being created, but I have no idea whether or not there's any health or environmental effects. And that's a problem. So for someone like myself, you know, between you and Julia, like, so I I know about water. Yeah. What are the other like biggest bang for your bucks areas that we're getting bombarded with toxins? For example, is food or is, I mean, we talked about air pollution, but there's not much we could do about that. Ah, that's not true. Okay. Okay. So wherever you want to go, I'm happy to go because I know nothing. Yeah. So I'll just kind of go down like the big categories. And like I said, I try to think of like, um, uh, what is it? Gold mining where you have like these different, um, screens with different gauges of wire and it starts with big and then it gets smaller. So I really try to sift this information through a couple of different screens. Mm -hmm. The first one is what's within our control. So air pollution outside, not within my control. Air pollution inside my home is within my control. All snap. Okay. Right. And the EPA has found that air in the air quality inside our homes can be five to 10, all the way up to a hundred times worse than air pollution outside. Why? Because energy efficiency, we close our windows, we bring in all these synthetic products, we paint our walls, our furniture has formaldehyde in it, and all of these products will off gas, but like they don't vanish. Those like molecules of chemicals don't just like vaporize into nothing. They live in your house. They settle in your house. And so that's why indoor air quality can be so bad. If you paint your house, that's where you get that like moving the air quality up a hundred times worse than outdoor air. So the first one in terms of this screen is like, what's, what is within our control? Let me focus there. The second screen that I sift through is just like you were saying, like, what are the biggest bang for your buck things that I can do? And the final screen that I'll sift through is what's free and easy, because this conversation feels 
totally overwhelming for people when they're like, oh, they first learn about all the things. I don't know if Julie, you had this experience when you were first learning and, and, and feeling like, oh my God, I have to throw everything out. I have to start all over. This is crazy. You know, we want people to not feel intimidated by the process and not have finances be a barrier to taking care of your health. A lot, like I was saying earlier, a lot of people that are um, lower income are disproportionately exposed. They have more exposure. So let's start with the things that everybody can do that's free and easy. So um, air quality, free and easy. Stop buying scented candles, air fresheners, Febreze, plug-ins, all of those home fragrances, because those home fragrances that we, you know, we think we like so much or we do like so much, they are part of what is polluting our indoor air. And most of those Synthetic fragrance compounds release chemicals called phthalates, which like bisphenols are an endocrine disrupting chemicals. Phthalates are found in 98% of people tested by the CDC. So they're in us. Um, and uh, they're linked to you know everything from birth, birth defects to weight gain and obesity. So metabolic disorders, um, you know, in the age of COVID, I'm looking at like, oh, all this attention is finally being paid to these comorbidities of Lifestyle, which are lifestyle diseases, heart disease, diabetes, these are lifestyle diseases and environmental toxin exposures play a big role in specifically things like metabolic disease, which is a newer area of research, but it's so important. There's some research that has been done looking at you know, giving really extraordinarily low doses of chemicals to rats and they can make them fat, make them skinny, change the color of their coats, they goody mouse studies. So you can turn on genes and the expression of genes that are like, well, now I'm going to make this rat fat, not because I changed his diet, not because his exercise has changed, but because I've exposed him to a chemical. Mm. We know, so in medicine, we know that there's many pharmaceutical drugs that have a side effect of weight gain. It's well established. Mm -hmm. Antidepressants often have this as a side effect. And that's referred to as chemically induced weight gain. So it's a cellular mechanism of weight gain. It's not because your caloric intake has changed. So like the fitness bros that are all like, it's calories in, calories out, just do your macros, work out. They miss this whole other dialogue about metabolic disorder and resistant weight loss and obesity and insulin resistance. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so I kind of went off target in terms of the conversation of phthalates, but phthalates are one of those chemicals that are found in most of those fragranced products. Um, everyone has phthalates in their home if they have these products. So I mentioned earlier that these chemicals off gas and then they settle. So where do they settle? They settle in your house dust. Nobody likes talking about dust, especially right now because I haven't cleaned my house very much <laughs> in Corona lockdown. But House dust is a really fascinating tool or item to look at that gives you a rundown of what the chemical uh, milieu is in your home because it's like a perfect pie. It's like a core sample of all of the crap in your house. And there was a meta-analysis a couple of years ago looking at all of the different house dust studies around the world. And 100%, not like 98%, 100% of samples in all of these studies had phthalates in them. So they're ubiquitous chemicals. They are everywhere. And so the first thing we want to do in terms of cleaning up our air is like, just don't buy these products. They're totally unnecessary. They also release, you know, VOCs like benzene, sometimes toluene, which are neurotoxins also related to metabolic issues in our homes. We don't need them. Bring some flowers in. If you really want something to smell nice, go with the essential oil route. But most people, oh, I say most, a lot of people use these scented products because their house smells bad. Mm -hmm. And so instead of looking for the root cause, maybe there's mold in your house, which else is also toxic, can be, you know, let's not cover up smells. Let's get rid of the bad smell and let's not douse our house in these synthetic fragrances. So you can open your windows. That's a free and easy thing. Everybody can do that. Even in a polluted city, if the air is worse inside, let's get it out. So open your windows, take off your shoes when you come in the door because we track heavy metals, we track, uh, track particulate matter in from the street, from car exhaust, pesticides if people are spraying them on their yard. If we have babies at home, where do babies go? They go on the carpet. What's the carpet? It's a magnet for all of these toxins. Hmm. So it's so important. Like all, We should be vacuuming our homes more and nobody wants to do this. 
me included. I, I say this, but we do want to be vacuuming more because we have all of these chemicals that are in our house dust. So if we can get that up and out of the house, great. So that's sort of the basics of like, everybody should be doing those things at a bare minimum. Um, when it comes to food, if you can afford organic, go with organic as much as possible, because a lot of the most of the conventional foods are going to have really low levels of pesticide residues. Now, people think, oh, the amount is so small, it couldn't possibly hurt me. When it comes to specifically things like endocrine disruption, and I don't know if, Julia, you have other things you want to contribute to this, yeah. this whole idea that like the dose makes the poison, this is sort of a fundamental tenant in, in toxicology, and that everybody I know in medicine learns this. Well, it's the dose that makes the poison. And that is a true statement, but it's not absolutely true. Traditional toxicology and industry like had dug digs in their heels and are like, that's not real, but we know it's real we, because that's our, that's how our endocrine system works. So if you talk to a pharmacologist or an endocrinologist, they, their whole practice of medicine is built on the foundation that no, in fact, low doses do matter because this is how the, how biology works. Mm -hmm. So the hormones that run through our bodies do so at levels that are like parts per trillion, really tiny, tiny amounts of hormones that can cause shifts in puberty and, you know, menopause. Those are giant experiential things that humans go through and it's a tiny change. So the idea that tiny amounts, similarly tiny amounts of chemicals that mimic those natural hormones are not a problem is a misunderstanding of biology. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear your thoughts as somebody who's been doing work in that space. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because that's actually exactly what my study found um, doing my master's. So I used three low doses of BPA that were considered to be environmentally relevant for humans. Um, and what we found was that our younger animals responded differently at different dosages. So their glucocorticoid receptor levels changed based on the smaller dosages versus the older animals that we tested responded in a monotonic yes. fashion. So we kind of hypothesized, like this was a very kind of exploratory study, but we did find different effects. So we did hypothesize that these non-monotonic responses, so not a linear dose makes the poison kind of situation is often what happens with BPA um, and other endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I think it's interesting because a lot of the regulatory processes that have happened to regulate these chemicals over the last hundred years have been on that kind of false yes. concept of the dose makes the poison, which is completely it's not, not really representative. Yeah, it's not representative of how we're actually being exposed. And it, you know, when I when I hear you about your research, to me that makes total sense that you have, you know, a, a higher exposure, non-monotonicity on the younger generation because they're still in development and what are our hormones necessary for development so you know the tedx uh not tedx the speaker but the the endocrine exchange tedx uh organization has this incredible interactive timeline of the research the critical windows of development is their interactive timeline and it's plotting all the research that's saying look week one of pregnancy here's the research that shows you know this chemical has this effect during week one, week two, week three, week four. So like there are these really critical windows of development during sexual differentiation where like we don't want synthetic estrogens or mm -hmm. those chemicals interfering with the, the process. Let's leave it alone. But that is what's happening. And then as we grow older, like some of those things are all set in place. And so the outcome to those low doses might be, they're not the same endpoints. And in my, you know, digging around to understand why is toxicology looking at only this one, this sort of false paradigm of like the dose makes the poison and it's absolute and everything follows that way. And we're just going to make a bunch of assumptions, but they're looking for endpoints that are like organ changes in organ weight, death. They're not looking at slight alterations in thyroid hormone or in, you know, anogenital distance differences. Mm -hmm. um, and for anybody who's yeah. like, what did she just say? Anogenital distance, the measure between the genitals and the anus is a representation or, or is a measure of feminization. So if you have a shorter anogenital distance, it means that you've been exposed to more estrogen during fetal development. 
Stop traffic. Yeah, and so this um, phthalates, for example, are so consistent in research studies in rodents um, in producing what they call phthalate syndrome, which is a cluster of symptoms that include a shorter anogenital distance, uh, undescended testes, smaller penis size, the shorter anogenital distance. Um, we're seeing that in males. So that we're seeing is a feminization of um, the male population, which is concerning. That's what I measured in my study too. Cool. Yeah. I'm like, I could probably nerd out with you talking about Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> Who else gets like excited talking about anogenital distance? Yeah. No one listening to this, but no, I mean, to me, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm bred in mainstream medical practice. And a lot of these concepts for me are absolutely foreign. And I think we don't get any exposure to this at all. No, really. None. And, um, I, I don't want to ruin your rhythm though. Like, uh, so like we talked about the importance of eating organic or why you should be eating organic. Are we happy with our food overview? Was there anything else that? Yeah. Oh, so I think the, yeah, the other things I'll add in there. So filter your water, eat organic food. I think when we're looking at that includes meat. So if we're looking at like, we want to have grass fed pastured meats as much as possible. We want to have organic dairy, dairy, cheese is like concentrated dairy. So if we have um, contaminants or pollutants in dairy, they tend to be a lot higher in the higher fatty cheeses and butters. Um, A lot of the chemicals that we're being exposed to or that are in our environment are fat soluble. They're lipophilic. So they're found in higher quantities and higher fat foods. So, you know, even in the health space, I see a lot of people doing like paleo and keto, Mm -hmm. which are like, you know, meat, dairy, heavy diets. And, you know, my concern is, are you just solving one problem and maybe causing another because you're increasing your consumption of these really hard to get rid of fat soluble toxins. So all meat is going to have some contamination. Doesn't matter if it's organic pastured, but organic and pastured will have less. It will also have a higher nutrient profile. So there's some extra benefit there. Um, I think we need to be really careful with our seafood consumption. So no tuna, no tuna sushi. Tuna can be really high in mercury. There's lots of different species of tuna and some like um, the bluefin tuna, which is like the prized fancy sushi tuna can have levels of mercury that um, exceed the uh, FDA guidelines and technically could be seized. But because the FDA doesn't have enough food inspectors to actually do that work, it just stays on the shelves and in your fishmonger and grocery store. So I don't think anybody should be eating tuna. It's a high mercury fish. Um, I don't think people should be eating farmed fish like tilapia. Um, Tilapia is an omnivorous fish. It eats anything. And fish farmers try to get away with um, or, or take advantage of that by feeding it chicken feathers and newspapers and literal garbage because it's cheap. Really? So tilapia is like, we talk about tilapia as being a garbage fish. Literally. Because it technically can live off of garbage. Don't eat tilapia. Oh. Sorry. (laughs) Like, again, not awesome news, but this is where like, we just start systematically doing the things we can in little steps. Like, okay, when I eat seafood, I'm going to aim for low on the food chain. So I think the acronym SMASH, SMASH fish. Salmon, mackerel, anchovies, herring, and sardines. Those are the Mm. species of fish that are going to be highest in omega-3s, which we love, and lowest in toxins and pollutants. What do you think about that? Hey! (laughs) (laughs) That's, yes. Smash! Smash fish. I love it. I love it. Yeah, so salmon, mackerel, anchovies, herring, and sardines. Yeah. Wow. And I don't like sardines, mackerel, or herring, so I mostly mostly eat salmon. Yeah. But you don't like mackerel? I don't. Oh, I it's don't. that's tight. That's I love yeah, it. Yeah, I just maybe I see the preparation. I need somebody to make it good for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so cleaning up seafood is good, and then in the food realm, the last thing that I think is a big needle mover for people is moving away from plastics where they come in contact with our food. So that means like our plastic Tupperware containers. Um, to start with, because, you know, I'm sure everybody has, first of all, the drawer that, that's that got like 14 bowls and like 38 lids. And you're like, where the hell did all the other bowls go? A hundred percent. 
So, you know, the goal is like, that's, those are all materials that I don't think should be used in food. I don't want people to be afraid of plastic or plastic phobic. Cause like, we're just not going to get away from plastic in our lives. And that's not the point. The point is we don't, we want to minimize its contact with the food and the water that we consume. So that means we're using glass food storage containers. If somebody can't afford to go out and buy those, they can reuse a pickle jar or a pasta sauce jar. Don't reuse plastic. I see a lot of people in like the zero waste space are like, just reuse your plastic. And I'm like, please don't do that. Buy a more sustainable material. And then, you know, the step above that is things like the packaging that your food comes in. So I know a lot of people in the health space love talking about fermented foods and how healthy fermented foods are for your gut microbiome and having a good, healthy, robust uh, gut microbiome. But a lot of sauerkraut, for example, um, is not only fermented in plastic, in these big, giant plastic bins, but it's also sold in plastic. And acidity, so uh, acidity, heat, oil, and abrasion are going to increase the leaching of um, some of these chemicals from plastics and a pH of fermented foods like sauerkraut or kimchi, like they're quite acidic. And so it's very likely that those fermented foods are going to have higher levels of phthalates, probably not BPA in those containers, but possibly phthalates, same ones that are in our air from the scented candles. Uh, so that's like, just if you have a choice between buying one sauerkraut in glass and one sauerkraut in plastic, buy the one in glass. Same thing with tomato sauce. If you can buy it in a jar, buy it in a jar over a can because canned foods are lined with bisphenols um, and then other PVC vinyl mm -hmm. uh, compounds, which do leach into our food. So minimize food packaging for sure. Um, and then, you know, from there, we're looking at like the other two big areas that are where people will move through on their sort of detoxing journey in terms of detoxing their home environment is their personal care products you know, what we're using in, in the morning are deodorants, shaving creams, shampoos, lotions, makeup. All of those products are also a mostly all made with those same phthalates. They often contain a whole host of other ingredients that can be linked to skin cancer even. And so we really do have to be thoughtful about the products that we're using. Our skin is our biggest organ, doesn't absorb everything, definitely absorbs a lot of things. Um, and, you know, when if we're thinking back to like sort of basic anatomy and sort of toxicokinetics, if you will, when we absorb something through our skin, when we inhale something or absorb something, it goes directly into bloodstream. So this is why, what is it that um, if you're having a heart attack, you take the um, nitro. nitroglycerin, right? You take nitro under your tongue and it's immediate. At least I'm, that's something I can contribute to in this. <laughs> See, there you go. And so that's immediate. So it goes right into the bloodstream. When you eat something, the food or the substance undergoes first pass metabolism in the liver. Mm -hmm. And so the liver gets a whack at it first. But when you absorb things through your skin or you inhale them, it goes right into your bloodstream. It takes a while before it ends up back at your liver for that uh, metabolism pass. Mm -hmm. And so the things that we put on our skin matter. And I think that it's important to systematically go through them. So I don't want people to feel like they have to throw everything out in the bathroom, but rather like when your shampoo is finished and you have to buy a new one, buy one that is not formulated with these synthetic compounds like phthalates that have so much research behind them. Woo! Woo! That reminds me a lot of the um, thermal paper in receipts. Yes. Oh yeah, it's another thing that's on the free and easy list. Try to not take or not accept the paper cash register receipts that people get because so you know that kind of powdery feel that yeah, on their yeah, paper? Yeah. That's free BPA. So BPA in plastic is bound, so it's a much slower to release. It's bound up in the matrix of the plastic. BPA on thermal paper is just sprayed on. And so that powdery feeling is free BPA. It goes and it's just powder. And so if you're handling a cash register receipt and you're eating French fries or whatever, you're literally just taking that free BPA powder and putting it right into your mouth. Um, there's been a couple studies that are looking at absorption rates of the BPA through your hands in conjunction with hand sanitizer, which everybody's been using for the last couple of months. And you can really jack up the amount of bisphenol that your body absorbs if you have hand sanitizer on. That study didn't really replicate actual use, 
normal use the study was sort of designed strangely, but I think it was a good starting place to understand uh, what was happening there. So yeah, say no to paper uh, thermal cash register receipts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, there is there is a lot. There is a lot, here. yes. A lot. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating that you do is that you educate healthcare providers, like you, you consult with them. Um, you know, we'll actually have a promo code uh, if I haven't given it in the intro or the outro, uh, solving healthcare to be able to use your amazing services. But how do I put this? What's the biggest impact you, you could, like that you see in coaching or informing some of our clinicians? Is it, do you see them getting a better grip of patients with chronic disease? Do you see them ordering more reliable tests? Like what's the transformation you see among healthcare providers? It's a good, really good question. And I think it depends. Like I, my students sort of run everything from like a health coach to a doula, to a physician's assistant, to a naturopathic doctor. So they're all kind of dealing with different patient client type of cases Mm -hmm. But, you know, what my students have found from a business standpoint for their own practices first is that, you know, because like you said, most people don't have training on this. They don't understand, you know, what these things are, where they're found, how they affect us and what do we do about them? I call that the what, where, how and what now, what they are, where they are, how they affect us and what, like what now, now that I know the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for practitioners to be able to help their clients understand this. It allows the practitioner to really differentiate their work from all of the other people out there that don't know anything about this relative to their field. So for example, if you're working around fertility, to be able to say like, I, as a fertility expert, I can help my patients really navigate cleaning up their environment. And for a lot of people, you know, that's a massive needle mover for that community is getting rid of all those synthetic chemicals that are interfering with sperm production or egg production or, you know, time to pregnancy. Um, so you get those, you, those stories get feedback yeah, today, yeah. like those testimonials. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it can be, a, it can be a big needle mover. You know, I had a, um, an experience that someone had shared with me um, not too long ago where she was a health coach, nutritionist herself. She had tons of training in the functional medicine space. Um, and she's like, I've been dealing with hair loss, like serious hair loss. My hair keeps falling out. I've done all the things, all the testing, labs, supplements, herbs, everything, and nothing is, it's just getting worse. And I cut my hair and I cry myself to sleep. It's awful. I didn't even work with her. She just heard me on a podcast talking about water contamination. And this light bulb went off for her and she's like, oh my God, my water system broke three months before this started to happen. And so she's like, I fixed the water filter system in the shower and the hair loss stopped. And within months, it started a couple months, a couple weeks, it started growing back. Wow. Now for her, like, I don't know what was in her water that caused that, but for her, that was the one thing that was standing in the way. And nobody even once considered that it could be something topical. I mean, that's, a, I mean, it's amazing just to have that extra tool in your arsenal in terms of evaluation. Like, you know, there's tons of these chronic conditions that you end up having stalemates with, yeah. you know what I mean? Like reproduction, as you've talked about, weight loss, thyroid yeah. function. Like I could see like a lot of our listeners nodding their heads like, yeah, man, a lot of us either have seen patients that way or have experienced it personally. And just knowing that, like one of the things that I, I'm always a big fan of is if the, if the solution can be relatively simple and have a, a large impact, yeah. like we should really think twice about it. And, you know, like some of these, obviously the stuff we talked about will have some cost to it, but some things don't like not getting receipts. Yeah, that doesn't cost anything. You know what I mean? Exactly. This, I mean, this is why I think it's so beautiful to, to bring up and, and hearing also like testimonials and scenarios where people have made these tweaks and fix their health solve their, their issues. Yeah. I mean, so what I've found and what my students have certainly um, reflected to me is that by the time somebody gets to working with a practitioner who's talking about toxins, they've all done all the other things before because they've gone through the conventional medical machine and they've been given this prescription and then had their seven minute doctor visit and that didn't work. So they saw a different specialist and that didn't work. So they end up in this sort of more integrative functional medicine space. Um, and then they finally might land on somebody that's like, hey, I think toxic mold is the problem in your, in your situation. 
you know, I, for example, I'll use myself as an example because I'm living in a house that has mold. I'm trying to get out. And the mold situation in my house has reactivated the Epstein-Barr virus from when I had mono in high school and I'm in my 40s. So I've been dealing with chronic reactivation of Epstein-Barr for years and I couldn't figure out why I was so sick. And I saw so many doctors. And then finally, someone's like, girl, I think it's mold. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm the environmental toxins person. It's not mold. It's mold. And so, you know, I think it takes, um, it it really does make the practitioner a lot more um, diverse in their ability to kind of scan the landscape and look at, okay, what might be going on that I'm missing that's sort of outside the standard practice lens, so to speak. Um, So I think that that's really valuable for practitioners. I think the other thing that I want to mention here is, you know, obviously toxins are not the only thing that people are dealing with. It's a thing that people are dealing with. And so all the other, the good nutrition, adequate sleep, like you got to get a good sleep, have to move your body and be outside. You have to minimize your stress. Stress is also toxic and can have, you know, it's linked to um, every, you know, inflammatory chronic illness or stress linked to like 80% of of chronic illnesses. Um, That's a component too. So this is not the biggest piece. It's just a piece of the conversation. And for me, what I've found is that logically, intuitively, and from what I hear from my clients, uh, my students, is that the, as I like to say, the magic happens when we focus on dialing down our exposures. We're never going to eliminate them altogether. That's, that's not possible, unfortunately, but we can do a lot to minimize it. So while we're dialing down our exposure, we are increasing our detoxification capacity. That means that we're loving up on our liver. We're making sure that we're pooping every day. I, I don't know, you know, if you have seeing people coming in, you know, in the, in the extra critical care setting. I don't know if this is a conversation that would come up there where they're like, yeah, I I poop once every five days. And you're like, what? I don't want to do it. But the poop stories are, I could, (laughs) I could speak to you for a month. I'll just say this one scenario. One of our colleagues actually studied this, your ability to come off a ventilator. So you see all those COVID patients, they take a long time to come off the vent, uh, off a life support. And one of the, key risk factors for failing to come off is lack of bowel movements. You will, you will see them, they haven't pooped in four, five, six days. They have a massive bowel movement. The fever goes down. They, they, their stomach actively looks better. They're easier to ventilate. And then they come off the vent. Wow. It is insane. Like poop is like, it's literally, I like to say number two is number one, because to me, to me, it's so important. It's literally the most important. And so I, you know, in the, in the health space, a lot of practitioners love to, to jump to detox and, you know, uh, you know, detox protocols and doing this with the phase one and phase two liver detoxification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's important. Yes. But not until you have the gate open and gate open is making sure you're having active bowel movements, because if you're not, you're just you know, we know that there's those intermediary metabolites of the detoxification process that can be more toxic than the original compound, right? This is part of why alcohol is so problematic. It's that intermediary metabolite that causes all those problems. If we can't get phase three open, phase three is pooping, right? It's getting it out of the body or peeing. Then we don't want to log jam up the process. That's kind of a double entendre in there, but (laughs) we want to make sure the log can leave. Right, we don't want the log jam. We ain't, we ain't quitting now. We're yeah, going, we're gonna go. We're gonna go deep, 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 deep in it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, the number one thing I think people can do on on the side of the conversation about optimizing their detoxification pathways is make sure you're pooping every day. If you're not pooping every day, go talk to your doctor. Figure out, talk to a nutritionist. Make sure you're eating fiber. Have some magnesium. Like, make sure that you're moving. Um, make sure that you're peeing. That means you you have to be hydrated because all those water soluble toxins need to have enough. They need to get processed through the kidneys. Kidneys need, need that water, um, making sure that we're sweating. So like, this is an easier thing that most people can do is sweat. There's so many chemicals that are excreted via sweat, including lead can often excrete like five or six times higher levels in your sweat than in your urine. So if you're living in a community that has lead paint, that has lead in the drinking water, and you're like, I can't afford to fix this, go find 
a gym or a YMCA or go buy a cheap two hundred dollars sauna on Amazon and is that yeah. how, is that how cheap they are? You can get cheap. They're, I mean, they're cheap. They're like the little ones that you sit in and your head sticks out. Oh, the, the portable uh, ones. Blankets, the portable ones. Do yeah. they work? You can get them. For, I mean, I got one on eighty dollars on Craigslist. So. And because I was literally, I wasn't going to interrupt you, but I was like, I'm going to, I'm trying to convince mommy to buy us a sauna. Oh yeah. Mommy needs to buy a sauna. Cause like, yeah. uh, you know, our gym is shut down over yeah. here, obviously COVID, but like, that's like my go-to. And uh, now you've given me I even mean, more ammunition. I, yeah. I knew this is a multiple values and having Laura on the show, but <laughs> I'm loving if, this. If you needed an extra nudge to get a sauna, go for it. I think it's so important. You know, you can sweat through exercise, but then make sure you take a shower because you have these fat soluble toxins that are in your sweat. And if you just kind of let it air dry, it's just going to go right back in your skin. So you want to wash it off mm. and wash it down the drain. So sauna, shower, don't sauna, hang out, talk to your friends sauna shower. Um, and you know, I think it's, this is something that everybody can be doing. There's some chemicals that will like, you know, lead is one example, but some of the more persistent chemicals like these, uh, PFAS chemicals and flame retardants will preferentially exit the body through, um, through sweat versus through urine. So that's a big deal. Um, and you know, regular sauna use is linked to all cause more reductions and all cause more doubt mortality like that's a big deal amen amen wow <laughs> i you know what actually Ju i was gonna ask julia this her her old man's a, a physician we work together um how well do you think this will be received do you know what i mean like how well do you think like when your dad hears about the stuff that you're doing like how yeah. well is that like has he altered anything in his uh in his world um, not really. He's kind of more of like a balance, balance is key mm -hmm. kind of guy. Um, but he exercises a lot. So he bikes to work, he sweats, he eats healthy. So things like that are great. But some of the stuff I do, like with how much I've learned about this. And yeah, how like many I'm years interested I've to, like, it, what, what do you throw down in your world right now? So what I'm doing is I've totally overhauled all of my products. So like skincare stuff, makeup stuff, deodorant, even things like that, where before five or six years ago, before I knew any of this, I was like, oh, that's not really necessary. I think, you know, it's one product. What's the harm of it? Or, but then you think about like hairspray, lotion, deodorant, everything that you're exposed to all the time you're like, okay, maybe some of these things do actually matter. And you have to at least try and reduce your exposure somehow, even if it's just like four or five products that you use every single day. Like I know women use maybe eight or nine products in the morning getting ready. And that's like 200 chemicals, for example. So if you're doing that every single day for like 20 or 30 years, then I feel like you're going to see some type of consequence potentially down the line. So for me, I'm kind of more of like a whole overhaul lifestyle wise. So that might be a bit too much for my whole family to adopt, but they're kind of interested. Like they learn, they like to learn about the kind of things I know and what I've kind of tried to do. So now my sister and I, my mom will kind of try a few things here and there with me, but for the most part, it's just balance. I think for them. Wow. Cause yeah. I, you know, Laura, I certainly hope our audience takes a lot of this into consideration because once again, simple tools, that could have a huge impact with their patients' lives. And mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it's just a lot of good that intuitively makes sense. Like I know one of the things I'm hoping you'll agree to is, I'm hoping we could do one of them like IG lives oh, or yeah. face, Facebook lives. Cause I think knowing my colleagues, they're like, well, what's the randomized control yeah. trial that's well, gonna I'm be showing? To, I mean, I'm like, happy to speak to that. Ab absolutely. I think because of the nature of this show, the fact that, you know, we're just doing an intro. Yeah. We're going to not only have you back for to do some some live so people can ask, ask these questions, but we'll I fully intend to take a deeper dive into a, yeah. a lot of these things that um, especially like maybe we'll like focus on endocrinopathies and or uh, hormone disorders and and um, reproduction, I think would be a, a great one, because I know like I think it's about 15 percent of, of of people are having reproductive issues. So. Like this is just such a huge topic that I think people would are are dying for are, and thirsting for knowledge here. Um, so maybe Julia, are we? Is there anything else, or even Laura, anything else that you think um, before shutting down that we should uh, just want to end with? 
I'll add, I'll add one more thing, which I think is, is helpful and important, maybe two things. The first is, you know, for a lot of these chemicals, the, the half-life or the transit time through the body is actually pretty quick. So, you know, phthalates can be under 24 hours. You have them in, they'll exit. BPA is actually shorter than that, I think, depending on its, how, how it's being exposed. Um, the fact that, you know, for BPA, the last um, NHANES pass, I think, was 93% of population has bisphenol metabolites. For phthalates, I think it was 98%. Um, the reason why those percentages are so high is just like Julia said, we're getting exposed multiple times a day, every day. And so we're filling the bucket faster than we can drain it. And so when we actually focus our efforts on draining the bucket, meaning reducing the amount coming in, we can actually see the measurable levels of these compounds in our body drop really quickly. So there's been a, you know, a, a handful of studies looking specifically on the consumption of organic foods and how switching from a conventional diet to organic diets, like what does that do to the levels of metabolites of these pesticides in the urine? They see an 80 to 90% drop in three to five days in both adults and children. Um, obviously, there's going to be a drop because if you're not taking it in, you're not ex you're, there's nothing to excrete. But what that good news is, it's telling us is that if we practice avoidance behaviors, we won't be in the 93 or 98% that have these low levels of chemicals in us, the same is true for beauty products. There was a really great study called the Hermosa study looking at Latina, young Latina girls in the Latina community, um, and they swapped out their personal care products. And they were measuring triclosan and parabens and phthalates. And they found that just uh, uh, seven days of using like paraben-free, phthalate-free beauty products, these teen girls saw like a significant 30 to 40% drop in the urine of these chemicals, my hunch is that that drop would have been more significant if the study also included other common sources of those same chemicals, not in beauty care, in the household cleaners, the air fresheners, the laundry detergents. If they also address those, I think that drop would have been more significant. But the point is that like, if we reduce our exposures and support the body's detox process, then a lot of these chemicals, like it's not, their transit time is very quick. Um, and so we just need to give our body a chance to kind of empty that bucket of those exposures. And, you know, certainly we don't necessarily have, there aren't, we're not testing chemicals on humans. That's unethical, except for that one BPA study that was so badass. I'm sure you know about the one um, <laughs> that did test um, this quote unquote safe level that the EPA is like, oh, it's 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight of BPA is the safe level that you can get every day. So research team was like, cool, let's test that on humans. And they did. And they found like one, I think it was one dosage or one day of exposure um, uh, led to um, insulin resistant markers. One day, one exposure. So not safe. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we are making inferences. The field of environmental science is, is very much hamstrung because we can't test things on people. So we have animal studies, rodent studies that we can do this work on. And then we have to lean on epidemiology and make inferences. And people get all in a, a tizzy about like, there is no randomized control top trial. There is no RCT for it. this. Well, because it's unethical to test chemicals on humans and there won't be. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there might be in, yeah. in rodents, but you know, anyway. I mean, I hear you. There's sometimes you, there just has to be a practical element to, to conclusion. Like not to say that you're making definitive conclusions, but you make some inferences yes. that with the best evidence that's in front of yes. you. And then you also ask yourself, what's the harm in adopting these strategies? And then, you know, I, I think we also, where you see success stories, I think that also has some street. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. Um, let me tell you, I, thoroughly enjoyed this episode and i'll tell you for several reasons one because i was a f like fully a student in this so like i really appreciate your the depth of of knowledge and and how you made it so practical and and easy to understand i like how you also threw in ties to you know socioeconomic status race and also something we're big on too is like lifestyle and getting people healthier especially with COVID being, you know, on the minds of so many and a narrative that really should be more upfront, like get healthy people now. Yes. No one's talking about that. 
I thoroughly enjoyed this. Julia, I, I feel like this was a great team effort, wouldn't you say? That was. Yeah, that was so fun. Absolutely. Yeah, that was awesome. So yeah, Lara, thank you so much for doing this. And we will definitely be connecting again. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. People, tell me that wasn't gangster. Quadcast Nation, that was so awesome. Please, if you enjoyed the show, leave a five-star rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. Sign up below for our newsletter. We'll get throwing down some uh, helpful tips and uh, what's coming up on upcoming episodes. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube at Quadcast. Leave any comments at Quadcast99 at gmail.com. Guys, man, we're changing the boogie in this one conversation at a time. I hope you guys enjoyed this. We will connect real soon. Thanks so much.